Hey everybody, how you doing today? This is Jim Prusak, physical therapist from the Pain PT, and we're going to talk today about emotions and what role they play in bodily symptoms. We're going to look at the science today. I want to throw some science in here to support the work we're doing here uh, because I feel like it legitimizes what we're talking about. It's not that we're making this stuff up. There's actually real science behind it. So we're going to look at this today. This is a study it came out this year, 2019, called Emotion Regulation in Patients with Somatic Symptom and Related Disorders, a Systematic Review. This was the first review study done on this type of stuff, meaning that they looked at a number of studies and pooled the data together to see what, what it means in terms of how we regulate our emotions and how that affects our body. So I included a citation here uh, if you want to go and get the study directly to look through it yourself. There's a lot of information in it. We're just going to go through some of it so I don't bore you to death and try to keep it so that you don't fall asleep either. But I think you'll find this very interesting because it really supports and gives some credence to emotions and how they really can affect us. So what the study did was it looked at two things. One of the things is what they call somatic symptom and related disorders, SSD. I'm going to use that term SSD throughout the rest of the slides just so you know. So somatic symptom and related disorders are basically bodily symptoms that are accompanied by excessive thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Now it can be any, it could be pain in different parts of your body. It can be disturbances in organ functions like your GI tract, respiratory system, chronic fatigue, exhaustion. Could be a number of symptoms. The bottom line here is that these symptoms are not attributed to structural causes, organic diseases like tumors or cancer, or biochemical or biomechanical abnormalities. So this is a lot of what I see here, and a lot of what we see with chronic symptoms of what we call TMS, tension myositis syndrome, coined by Dr. Sarno, or more recently, the medical communities call this PPD, psychophysiological disorder, disorders, very common, very much undiagnosed, and the medical community at large doesn't really see this. They don't ask the questions, they don't look for this, but it's really important. I'm going to show you why. So the second piece here is this emotion regulation, and we're talking about how does emotion regulation fit in with these somatic symptoms in the body. Well, emotion regulation, according to the authors here, is basically a way of dealing with our feelings. Okay, it's a suite of effortless and effortful processes, either with or without conscious supervision, that changes the spontaneous flow of emotions. So we all feel emotions. We all have emotional responses and reactions to what's happening in our things in our lives or in ourselves. But when we change how we regulate these emotions, meaning we don't just let them flow anymore, we actually change how we deal with them, that's called emotion regulation. And so we're going to talk today about how this plays into somatic symptoms in the body. So they go on to say that emotion regulation, in a broad sense, is not really healthy or unhealthy without the context of what it's about. So they look at certain strategies here or processes that people use. One of the common ones, and we talk a lot about this, is emotional suppression. We hold our feelings in. We don't say what we feel, we bottle up our feelings, or we disconnect from emotional experiences, or we either underreact or overreact, hypo or hyperactivity to emotions, or even reappraisal, how we, we think about what we believe about our emotions. This is all part of our emotion regulation strategy for some of us. And they go on to talk about, again, this last paragraph about uh, suppressing emotions, rumination, catastrophizing. That's all part of this process. So what is this research about? What did the authors look for? Well, the question, the central question they had was how do patients with SSD regulate their emotions? And so they looked back at all the data, all the research that's been published between January 1985 and June 2018. And there were over a thousand studies they looked at. They included 64 here. And these are the 64 best studies. We're not going to go through all 64 because 
Uh, you'll probably fall asleep on me here, but we're going to talk about uh, a number of them just so you can get a sense of the data and what's come out of it. So this first page here, some interesting study results, talked a bit about how people with seizures and people with chronic back pain and chronic fatigue have a difficult time switching their attention uh, from the emotional dimension of things or, or from emotions in general. And they did some studies on this to show that this was true. Um, and it's quite interesting because this difficulty in switching attention from emotional material was predicted by the somatic symptoms, depression, childhood trauma, which could be adverse childhood experiences, and disassociation. They also found that in these two studies, there was a association between suppressing your emotions, holding your emotions in, and this what we call attentional fixedness, which is what I just talked about above, inability or difficulty switching your attention away from emotions. So there was an association between when you hold your emotions in, people tend to fixate, have a hard time getting their attention off the emotions. It's very interesting because this was also found in people with chronic back pain and also in chronic fatigue syndrome. So it's across the board. It's not just one physical condition, but a number of different conditions. So you guys are going to like this. This really supports the work of Dr. Sarno, uh, one of the pioneers in this field of mind-body medicine. So some of these study results found that um, anger and the way we deal with anger can really impact how we feel in our body and with our symptoms. All the studies they looked at here were about pain and fibromyalgia, except for one that looked at irritable bowel syndrome. So all of them basically found an association between excessive expressive anger suppression, which is holding your anger in, or uncontrolled anger expression and having bodily symptoms, somatic symptoms. Very interesting. So if you either really expressed your anger in an uncontrollable manner, anger out, meaning you just freaked out, that was related to acute pain intensity, at higher acute pain intensity. And likewise, if you held your anger in, you know, people had more symptoms than, than those who are healthy controls or people just with medical explained pain. So holding your anger in, what it did was it actually created more end of the day pain, more acute pain intensity, more state pain and pain interference, depression, alexithymia, which is the inability to uh, put words to your feelings, and mental distress. So this really supports the work of, of Dr. Sarno here about holding anger in or raging out. Both those, those extremes there tend to create problems in the body. So one interpersonal study found that greater anger inhibition was related to decreased concurrent spouse criticism, which basically means that patients um, might hold their anger in to avoid criticism from their partner or let's say their wife or husband, but they do that at the expense of greater pain. So when we hold our anger in, in this particular case, it's been shown to create more pain in the body. Another diary study showed that the lowest pain in patients was with people who actually expressed their anger. Okay, so we found that people who actually expressed their anger had the lowest pain. Also, people who naturally want to express their anger, but they held it in, they actually displayed more pain behavior and symptom-specific muscle reactivity. And they also recovered the slowest compared to other people who didn't suppress their anger. So this is right in sync with the work of Dr. Sarno with repression and suppression of emotion. Another study found an interaction between suppressing our emotions and somatic symptoms and that people who experience emotions intensely but suppress them suffer the most from the impact of symptoms. So we've got some real science here to back up what Dr. Sarno and many other of us have been talking about for a while here now, that holding in emotions can really cause bodily symptoms. 
So another study here that people who had somatoform disorders, which is basically bodily symptoms, reported a lower capacity to non-verbally express their feelings and controls. And this was associated with this alexithymia. I did a video on alexithymia on my, my PPT YouTube page, and you can look at that. It's really interesting. Uh, it's one of the most, probably one of the words that nobody's ever heard of, but it's really common with chronic pain. So people have this tendency in a, in a study here that showed people have this tendency to bottle up their emotions because they believe that expressing them does not make a change. It's not going to help them or they have fear of rejection or they don't want to worry others. So this is important. This is why people bottle up and suppress emotions. But as we know, it doesn't really, really help us. People also, when we, we talk about the autonomic nervous system here, um, another study found that people who have somatic vigilance, people who are always checking their body, always checking in, looking for things, um, they have a, a reduced capacity to downregulate the autonomic nervous system to stress. And they found in the recent study that even people who were in a resting state, these people had chronic whiplash, uh, they had presented with reduced heart rate variability which basically means they, they couldn't get relaxed, they couldn't get into that parasympathetic rest and digest state. So two studies um, indicate this, that there's a hypervigilant emotional system that's expecting a continuous threat and has an inability to inhibit sympathetic activation. And we talk a lot about this here, about how our system, our nervous system overreacts to what it perceives as a threat or danger, and it can't turn off the sympathetic nervous system. So the studies support this, that we're hypervigilant, people that are very hypervigilant, always looking out for something, for danger or threat, they're basically keeping that nervous system, that fight or flight system, turned on. So again, the autonomic nervous system, again, finding that people have a harder time getting into that rest and digest state and they typically have increased sympathetic activation. This is across people with somatoform disorders, IBS. Um, people were watching a, a film that had fear-related uh, stuff in it, had a harder time relaxing. They had a greater sympathetic reaction found in these people. Also found it in people with chronic fatigue syndrome. So one of the things I want to talk about here is switching from the autonomic nervous system to our beliefs and our thoughts. Okay, that also plays into a lot of chronic symptoms. So beliefs about emotions were shown to be a predictor of uh, bodily symptoms in five studies they did that they looked at. Um, for example, people with seizures um, reported more negative beliefs about emotions and, and they thought of their emotions as being more overwhelming, uncontrollable, shameful, irrational, contagious, useless, and damaging than did the control people. A positive correlation was also reported between negative beliefs about emotions and seizure severity. So people who have this negative thought processes or negative beliefs about emotions had greater seizures. And we had found the same thing with people with chronic fatigue, that they held significantly more beliefs about the unacceptability of experiencing and expressing emotions than, than controls, than healthy people, especially prior to the onset of, syn of the syndrome. So these negative beliefs and thoughts that people have were associated with depression, anxiety, fatigue, and self-sacrifice, as well as self-reported suppression. Again, holding emotions in. That's a very common theme that you're seeing here. So really, there's a lot of facets here they're finding. Um, some of the other general things they found in the studies was that our attitudes towards emotions um, of non-acceptance of, of feeling emotions, of non-judging of emotions, our tolerance to emotions, and being able to access strategies to deal with our emotions um, and emotional clarity. These were other facets that were important in, in somatic symptoms in the body. So 
there's a lot more data here. And again, you can go to the study to pull out some more of the individual uh, studies that they looked at, all 64 of them. But the conclusions of the study were this. The findings confirm that patients with SSD encounter ER difficulties, emotion regulation difficulties. That was the general finding. The literature has quite consistently shown patients' dysfunctional knowledge-oriented emotion regulation, such as reduced capacity of emotion awareness or emotion recognition. So what they're saying is that in pretty much all these studies, they found a link between dysfunctional emotion regulation and somatic symptoms in the body. So it's very interesting and it's, it's very telling. We know this anecdotally, but now we're seeing it scientifically. And so we have this sort of mixed bag end. So we know that, that patients who, uh, there were many patients who reported suppressing their emotions to a great, great extent, but there are also people who they found that they're actually more expressive of their negative emotions through bodily behavior. And that also was linked with uh, more symptoms in the body. So we have both things here. So we have to kind of look at uh, either overly express expression of emotions, freaking out, taking it too far, and under expression of emotions, suppression of emotions. Both those extremes create symptoms in the body. And the last thing I want to talk about is that we're talking about many different symptoms. If you didn't hear your symptom uh, called out here, it doesn't mean that you're not included because what they found was that there's many types of this SSD, bodily pain, fatigue, organ-specific, functional neurological problems, GI symptoms, all presented with similar emotion regulation difficulties. And they found that this reduced emotional awareness and reflection capacity, rigid emotional attention, or aberrant autonomic activity, which is the sympathetic nervous system, were shared by many different diagnoses and types of SSD. So any real uh, condition that hasn't been shown to have a structural cause or organic cause can be included in here. And almost all these had some type of emotion regulation issue to it. So what's the final words here that I'll leave you with? This, these are the final words from the study. is basically saying that we need to, as practitioners and people working with people with somatic symptoms that are unexplained by physical causes, we need to examine these people and, and provide intervention that is geared towards looking at how people deal with their emotions as an integral part of these chronic symptoms. So it can't be more clear in terms of what we need to do. And that's what we do here at the Pain PT and a lot of other practitioners in this mind-body field. We're looking at emotions and how people deal with emotions in their lives and how that plays into their symptoms. So hopefully you learned a couple things here today from a scientific side and just to know that there's uh, enough science here for sure to back up this sort of theory or this idea that emotions can cause pain or can cause symptoms in the body. If you have any questions or you want to reach out to me, you can find me at thepainpt.com or you can always email me at jim at thepainpt.com. Thanks everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.